So with that, let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Professor Patty Mace is almost a legend, if not a legend, in this, in this uh, building. Uh, she has, uh, my personal view of her work is that it's fantastically humane. As we go into this, uh, down this rabbit hole of AI and technologies, there's a lot of efforts out there that are basically assuming that the human is the wrong shape or the wrong something, and they want to drill holes in your head and do other things. Well, uh, Patty's work is about the interface being much more fluid much more humane, none of those drilling holes in your skull things, okay? Uh, I think she will agree with me that if I, if I summarize your approach in saying that she's sort of the opposite of Elon Musk. She says, make the computers adapt to humans, not the other way around, okay? <laughs> it's wrong to go the other way around. Don't make humans adapt to computers. Make computers adapt to humans. They're ours after all. So um, she will talk uh, about well-being and uh, olfaction, and uh, her group is the only other group that I know of that has had serious uh, program in olfaction at the Media Lab, and we'd like to expand on that. I think the olfaction is uh, the next frontier, it's the last sense, and uh, the world of molecules around us is so vast, and the information contained in our body odor, for instance, is so um, rich to the right noses with the right uh, technologies, we are on the precipice of a future where we can sniff our environments and each other and ourselves and detect disease, detect mood, detect threats. At the same time, this provides us with a challenge of how to handle this technology, how to make sure that, for instance, since we will be very soon able to just point a phone at someone and know if they're pregnant, let's say, which has now become almost a criminal act in this country, and to know even what sex they're carrying or who the father is. Those things are possible and they're within reach, uh, but the question becomes who, uh, who's going to own these data, who's going to annotate these data, who's going to rent, sell, and do things with these things. As we have the science forward, uh, you know, propagated by people such as Professor Mays, we also have lawyers and law students here, and this is one of the few times we've invited lawyers to see what this technology is going to, uh, what challenges it's going to present for us, and how can we make sure that the laws are ahead of the game. So with this, I bring you Professor Patty Mays. Thank you so very much. Let me connect you. And everything's <laughs> shut down. <laughs> nope, there you go. Oh, Good job. Awesome. Okay. Oops. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. A very exciting conference. Um, I'll be talking about olfactory user interfaces for health and well being. And um, unlike some of Andreas's own work, my work is actually more about olfactory displays rather than uh, systems that can, uh, digital systems that can sense uh, and, and uh, smell, basically. But I'll, I hope to show you that there's um, sort of a lot of applications for these olfactory displays as well. First, a little bit about where I come from. So I run a uh, research lab here at the Media Laboratory upstairs. And uh, what I'm especially interested in is how digital devices can help us thrive. Uh, today's devices, of course, put the world's information at our fingertips. But could they do more than that? There are many. Um, sometimes they're called soft skills or cognitive functions that are really important for people to thrive and to be able to accomplish their dreams and so on and uh, have a happy, successful life. It's things like uh, being able to be attentive or um, having a good memory or, or effective, being an effective learner, being able to be creative when needed, um, being able to <laughs> sleep uh, in a, or having healthy sleep habits, regulate your emotions so that anxiety, depression, etc., don't prevent you from uh, uh, reaching your goals. So we're very interested in, in whether personal devices could actually help with these types of functions in addition to giving us um, information. So <clears throat> in our lab, we typically build these closed loop wearable systems, uh, on-body systems, that on the one hand sense uh, a lot of the information about a person, maybe um, physiological information, uh, maybe uh, sensing brain activity, maybe one day <laughs> sensing um, their uh, uh, sm uh, smells or scents, 
that typically gets analyzed and then we actuate or stimulate, um, uh, provide stimuli to the person that can help them with a particular function they're trying to really get better at, attention, memory, sleep, whatever. The actuation or the stimuli typically are things like sound or haptics or also electrical stimulation and more. We've even done crazy <laughs> things like um, looking at temperature stimulation. It turns out, for example, that um, all of us um, uh, experience at times this sensation of aesthetic chills, sort of feeling like there's some cold running down your spine, basically, when you see something beautiful or you see something touching. or um, And it turns out that that is sort of um, uh, a phenomenon that drives cognition. So people end up being more attentive. They end up remembering more right after or from that moment. Uh, they are more open, more empathetic um, uh, when that happens to them. And so we've been working on basically giving people artificial sensations of chills uh, because those can then again result in the same cognitive effects that the person remembers more of the moment, has a heightened experience of the moment and more. Um, another somewhat crazy sense that we've, or modality that we've been working with is uh, proprioception. We've been doing electrical stimulation of the mastoid area uh, behind the ears, which is your balance system. And we can actually give people artificial sensations of being moved to the right or moved to the left and so on. And we use that in a variety of applications, for example, to give people the sensation that they are being rocked to help them fall asleep um, or to prevent uh, car sickness when you're reading in a car or motion sickness in virtual reality, etc. So we like to really push the boundaries of what kind of modalities are used to um, basically interface with the human body and mind. But until recently in, in our whole field of human-computer interaction, people have really not done all that much with scent. Um, and even though, of course, as you're hearing at this conference, scent is incredibly important. Um, it may alert us to danger, for example, in the case of fire, or it is a major uh, aspect of our um, uh, uh, perception of taste also. Um, it helps us with uh, remembering uh, because uh, the olfactory bulb actually is very close to the hippocampus and that is uh, most likely why sort of scents uh, often bring back memories for people. So it's a very uh, powerful modality that is underexplored. There are lots of um, interesting research papers that tell us what some of the potential could be of um, basically systems that can produce scent for people also. For example, people can smell happiness. They can smell fear in, from other people. Um, uh, scent or being exposed to certain scents reduces pain or, or increases pain tolerance. Uh, can help with memory, um, with uh, being alert and attentive, like peppermint, for example, or rather helping you fall asleep uh, with things like lavender. Um, it can uh, improve mood, um, change the content of dreams, and more. So set is an incredibly powerful modality that is underexplored in human-computer interaction. Another um, example of great work by um, Anat Arzi, she showed that you can actually uh, expose people to or pair the scent of cigarettes uh, for a smoker with um, a scent that is very unpleasant in slow wave sleep or deep sleep, and that results in the person smoking less the next day without them being aware whatsoever that anything happened to them at night. Uh, so purely using scent as an interface to change behavior. Uh, people like Bjorn Rasch 
have shown that you can do targeted memory reactivation. So you can help people learn and memorize things with scent by pre uh, basically presenting a scent uh, as a person is learning something and then reproducing that same scent during slow wave sleep results in the person showing better recall of what they've learned than if you just gave them, say, water or something. So a lot of potential here, but if you look at scent display um, or smell display interfaces, there actually isn't all that much out there. Maybe the most recent thing was the, the O phone, which I didn't include here, which was a little gadget that you add to your iPhone uh, that can uh, uh, add some scent to some messages that you send to someone else. But in general, sort of these um, scent interfaces have been very bulky, not very usable. Um, of course, in psychology, especially in uh, sleep studies, people make use of scent interfaces, but they typically look like that picture in the middle bottom there. So that's what the person <laughs> has to wear to uh, engage in one of these um, uh, uh, experiments or to be a subject in one of these experiments. Or on the right, this is from uh, Bjorn Rasch's work that I mentioned earlier. This requires a special sleep lab, uh, a lot of expensive equipment. The person, of course, doesn't sleep all that well with all that stuff on them. And so this really limits uh, the, the lack of these compact and, and uh, comfortable technologies really limits what kind of experiments we can do. So the work that I'll presenting for the, uh, will be presenting for the rest of the lecture here is actually the work of one of my students who has graduated now, but is still a research affiliate in my group. Um, Judith Amores Fernandez is a senior researcher now at Microsoft, and she's also a research fellow at the Harvard Medical School at MGH, uh, as well as working here at the Media Lab. And uh, she came uh, into my lab about seven years ago or so, and um, basically proposing to uh, do really interesting novel work in this area of personal olfaction devices and uh, looking at different applications for them. So again, going back to our picture, typically we built uh, olfactory user interfaces, and she has been building olfactory user interfaces that sense the uh, physiology or some other aspects of the person's behavior and body and mind, and then um, the olfactory device can basically process that information and can uh, offer or um, actuate the uh, scent interface to produce certain uh, scents at certain times based on uh, the person's uh, information to help them with some uh, cognitive uh, skill. The first device that she built was this one, um, the Essence uh, necklace, which just consisted of one container and um, basically you can either manually just pull the cord to release the scent or uh, the system also has uh, um, heart rate, heart rate variability, electrodermal activity, etc. Uh, from a watch basically that we pair with the device and so you can actually in an automated way also based on date, time, uh, GPS information and so on you can uh, release the scent, uh, decide in what quantity, etc. So it turns out that different people have diff um, are different levels of sensitive <laughs> to scent. Some people are super sensitive and some are not at all. And so it is important with these devices that you can customize things, personalize things based on uh, a particular person, also their associations with different scents. We all have different associations with scent, and some of us may not like roses or lavender, uh, while most of us do. And so it's important to be able uh, to customize the device. Using this device, um, Judith, and you can see it here in action, so on the back it has the processor, Bluetooth, battery, and so on, so you can just wear it. And um, there's the fragrance container, which actually can give you 28 hours of um, 
uh, sent, uh, uh, basically wireless communication with a smartphone, etc. And uh, Judith actually won an award for this, um, as well as several uh, uh, best paper um, uh, awards. And uh, you can use this device for a variety of applications, which I think we'll see here. Uh, which involve uh, coupling the device with sensors, like I said, in a closed loop, for example, the MUSE for EEG, brainwave activity sensing, or the E4, um, or you could use a, a, a smartwatch uh, wristband, which gives you heart rate, electrodermal activity, uh, heart rate variability, all of those physiological sensors, and EEG uh, included, can tell you whether a person is anxious, stressed, sleepy, alert, etc. And we couple that uh, information, basically, with the device releasing scent uh, to help the person either, say, calm down or maybe be more alert if they're driving a car and they need to, oops, sorry, they need to um, be more alert behind the wheel and so on. So you see the device here in action. So we have the Muse headband and we can detect with that all sorts of um, information, including uh, attention um, uh, and so on. Uh, the device can be used at night as well based on uh, sleep staging uh, that can be done with uh, the EEG device and so on to, for example, uh, only release scent uh, in slow wave sleep. Uh, the application that I previously mentioned of coupling a scent with learning and then at night reinforcing that learning, it's important that you only present the scent in slow wave sleep. Otherwise, the person may habituate to the scent if you're just all night long presenting that scent it isn't necessarily gonna work. So uh, we actually uh, produce that scent when the EEG system, together with the heart rate, et cetera, tells us that the person is in the slow wave uh, sleep cycle of uh, sleep and um, to uh, help the person uh, with learning and memory issues. It can be used in virtual reality. In fact, Judith won a best paper showing that uh, basically using scent for relaxation improves uh, the relaxation score of a person who's uh, using um, sort of a VR experience uh, to help them uh, relax. Um, next, Judith actually realized that um, you really need more than one <laughs> scent container and so she created a system that has three containers and that also as part of it can measure heart rate and respiration. So you can just clip it um, over here or wear it again on a necklace and it can detect heart rate and breathing rate just from your movements basically so that you no longer need to couple it with a special smartwatch. And we have three different containers so that you can have multiple um, uh, basically scents that you can use for multiple purposes. For example, one scent uh, for uh, pairing with learning, one scent for improving quality of sleep, uh, one scent for alertness like peppermint to make a person more uh, alert and so on. The device can be used in many different ways. You can also clip it to a little stand like this thingy <laughs> that um, uh, releases the scent at night and uh, if you still remember the picture that I showed you earlier, that is a lot, uh, a much more comfortable situation to be in than having that whole device uh, uh, sort of attached to your head. So this shows uh, the build of the system and there's again an app that goes with it where you can choose scent duration and frequency and do the physiological monitoring and so you can say things like if the heart rate is this high and the person is in a car or if the person is not attentive and they're in a car then release peppermint if the person is in slow wave sleep then release this other scent etc you can customize the, the amount of scent the duration all of that uh, you see the device here being uh, controlled from uh, the smartphone, 
And we use this system in a series of um, uh, experiments, again, human subject experiments. We had 40 subjects. And in our first experiment, we just wanted to make sure that people could use this and that um, it wasn't preventing them from sleeping properly and so on. And so uh, we did that by having people use it. You see some of the pictures there of uh, uh, the different subjects uh, having installed a system where they sleep. Um, and they basically were all, uh, pretty much all of them, uh, satisfied in terms of uh, how well the system worked and how easy it was to set it up and refill it and so on and use the holder. Um, the majority of people did not wake up uh, because of the scent, uh, uh, which is important. We did customize the scent, uh, the amount of scent actually, based on how sensitive people were. And people were generally uh, not really aware of the device and uh, the smell and the sound while sleeping, so it didn't prevent them from sleeping well. Yet at the same time, the scent does have an effect. We actually um, collaborated uh, with some uh, other people to show that using our device during sleep, um, right there on the right, when with a person wearing an EEG cap, you can very clearly see on the EEG topography that the scent is changing the sleeping brain of the person. <clears throat> so we, um, people, uh, that used scent, lavender actually, um, as opposed to just water in the device, reported an improvement in their sleep uh, quality that was significant. Um, also, improvement in, sleep, in mood the following day, uh, perceived time to fall asleep, perceived rest, perceived deep sleep. Actually, those were um, not significant, but still a trend. Um, but um, mood and perceived time to fall asleep were uh, statistically significant, um, better in the condition of receiving the scent versus water. Um, we then also did a study about um, learning um, in a home, basically using targeted memory reactivation, the idea that I introduced earlier of pairing a scent during the day with um, uh, the uh, person learning, learning something and then reintroducing that same scent at night. And um, we uh, built a whole system to do sleep staging using um, the uh, uh, sensor that we uh, used in this case, the Muse, so that we could release uh, the scent at the right uh, time. <clears throat> and did a study with 32 subjects where they had to learn words in another language and um, locations of those objects in a space as well. And uh, they were, so we, it was a within subjects uh, experiment so that the same people would learn, um, I believe it was 20 words, first with scent condition and then 20 words that were equally hard to learn also in that second language the person didn't know without scent. Um, the whole protocol actually was very elaborate because people had to come in one day, um, learn all these objects and their locations, and um, then they got tested the following day on which ones they remembered, like where were the objects, what were the names in this uh, other language that they didn't know. Then a week later, they came in again and they would get the condition without scent, or we actually uh, randomized the order, so some would get water first and then scent a week later, others would get scent first and then water a week later. And so we again um, had them learn all of the locations and test, we tested them the next day. And then again, actually, um, sorry, I should say, uh, so for uh, in, one condition, the person gets the scent at night as well, uh, while in the other condition, they just have the water uh, at night. And we tested them again two to three weeks after they um, learned the words uh, to see whether which of the words they still remembered and the locations of the words as well. So it was both a 3D um, 
learning task, a um, spatial task, as well as sort of a task of remembering uh, the names of things in this other language. And we also, <clears throat> uh, so you see some of the objects here, like window, ventana, com, pen, pen and so on. Um, the test looked like this. You had to remember where an object was and then also write down the English uh, word um, or, and the Spanish word for that uh, object. We also tested a 2D task, actually, just uh, uh, so we had people do both the 3D and the 2D task. Um, and um, if ultimately, um, we saw uh, basically in the um, uh, object memorization uh, tests, pre-sleep and post-sleep, we saw a significant difference for the people that got the scent condition. So the scent condition, people who received scent during sleep the following day, they remembered um, sig uh, statistically significant uh, higher uh, number of the locations as well as the names of things than the people, uh, than the same people just getting water. Um, we also looked at translation and again, not just location, but uh, the translation of the words they did significantly better than the water condition. For the 2D task, we did not get the same result. It was inconclusive, uh, basically. Uh, the 2D task, task was really hard. You just had these words. Um, you had to remember where the word was in the grid and then also the translation of the word uh, into the other language. Um, so again, um, for uh, one to three weeks later, the people that received the scent in the, e the night after they learned the words did significantly uh, better uh, in terms of memorizing those objects. For translation, it was, um, the trend was there, we didn't have enough uh, data probably to show the statistical significance. And for memory, the 2D memory task, it was about the same and people did pretty poorly <laughs> overall, basically. Um, we also looked at um, how much time people spent into different sleep stages and noticed that there was a statistically significant difference for deep sleep. And you have to know that deep sleep or slow wave sleep is actually the most important part of sleep because that's where um, it's correlated basically with cognition or cognitive performance with learning and so on. So that is the sleep that you want to uh, improve or the part of sleep that you want to lengthen, especially also for older people. Older, the older you get, the less deep sleep and of course, the older you get also, the less good your memory is and so on. So there's lots of opportunities um, for just even increasing uh, time spent in slow wave sleep and uh, helping people with memory and performance. Sleep quality uh, was also significantly better for uh, in the scent versus the water condition. In summary, I want to um, say that Scent or smell as an output based on physiological signals is an incredibly interesting area with lots of potential uh, applications that can really improve people's lives. Uh, we fabricated uh, and designed some of the first wearables that make it easy to do this at home. And we are the first to really do these studies in the wild at home. Until now, these studies with scent and uh, sleep, for example, were just all done in a lab setting, never at home. Our devices proved to be usable and robust and had significant effects on relaxation, better sleep and memory. <clears throat> possible other applications that we could look at with these, and I'm sure you guys will have many more. Um, Real-time memory support could um, incentivize, help people that have memory decline maybe with um, 
remembering things in the moment. Behavior change applications, I talked earlier about a study done in a lab setting again uh, with uh, smoking and reducing uh, smoking for people that are addicted. Um, that is still a wide open area that people just haven't gone further because it's so difficult to do these studies, but now this is possible. Um, maybe we can alleviate respiratory systems or help with asthma by having a device that in the moment can release things based on data about a person. Maybe there's even opportunities for doing um, small dosage drug delivery in the moment based on what a person's state is, whether they're suddenly super anxious or uh, and need help and so on. So. Thank you. Um, feel free to get in touch if you're interested in this work. And um, yeah, Thank you. the website. So th this was a tour de force. Thank you so much. I'm so impressed with, with Patty's presentation here. And uh, I'll take the first question. I'm sure there's other questions on the internet. But um, I, I can try and limit it to one because there's so many. Uh, my first comment is that what a robust and rigorous work that was. And a lot of the time in olfaction, uh, we, call, we, we have the problem of it being qualitative. We're trying to understand what kind of smell this is and look at uh, uh, this group and uh, this work showing you the statistics of it, showing you the error bars. I am so thrilled. I'm a physicist. <laughs> I, I'm a little bit of a, <laughs> of a fetishist with error bars. And uh, this is the first presentation actually we have that has a really robust <laughs> statistics. Thank you for that. Now, my question is this. Um, we have an anosmic in our group, uh, Tara Scudder. She has never ever smelled anything. Mm. And I wonder if you used her for your studies, would mm. her EEG actually light up? Because we don't know why she's anosmic, but oh. she might still, if she experiences the same benefits without yeah. conscious perception, because yeah. your people reported to not consciously remember perceiving yeah. the scent, yeah. we, it would be very, very interesting to find out if yes. she has no conscious perception and yet she has those effects, why mm -hmm. is that? And does her EEG change if yes. her nose, because we know olfactory receptors are not expressed just up in the epithelium. Yeah. Recently we learned it, it, they're also expressed in the lungs mm -hmm. and many other places. And during development, they're expressed everywhere uh, yeah. because that's what guides the, the formation yeah. of the fetus. So well, we'll uh, be happy to do the experiment. <laughs> yes, so Tara, if you're listening, there's another person who wants to experiment on, on you. My final question uh, is, where can I get this? I want to put this in my bedroom and I want to use not the big face mask, I want the, <laughs> the little thing. Yes, um, yeah, good question. It, um, Judith actually went very far with um, basically going to Shenzhen, China to like uh, manufacture this, uh, make molds and all of that. Uh, we would need to get some business partners and people that are eager to uh, take this forward basically. <laughs> Um, to uh, and to really make it available um, to researchers as a start <laughs> to do these experiments in home settings. Yeah. Well, the so, Osmo Cosmo community yeah. should listen to Professor Macy. Yeah. She just asked you for business partnership. This is what Osmo and Cosmo money. does. <laughs> and money. That, that goes without saying. But Funding. if somebody wants to commercialize this yeah. amazing technology, mm -hmm. this is the place you've heard about it. Now let's reach out to Professor mm -hmm. Mays. And, um, do we have any, anybody else who wants to... We have, uh, Vlasta has a, a question from the audience and then we need to move to our next presenter. Yes, uh, Go hello, ahead. thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, I'm now working uh, with Andreas also on uh, some olfactory uh, project uh, um, including biomaterials. But I, what I found very interesting were all the studies that you did that you mostly done with people that were like over 25, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering like if you ever consider to work with kids mm -hmm. and maybe like on the long term, uh, basis observe if the use of scent in this various form uh, would help them mm -hmm. in the process of mm -hmm. learning and maybe become more creative mm -hmm. like over the period of time if you think mm -hmm. they perceive the sense differently when yeah. they're young. We haven't really worked much with kids one reason being that um, sort of different rules apply <laughs> in terms of getting approvals for human subject experiments and so on so we thought we would just first experiment or do these uh, um, uh, 
projects, uh, uh, these studies uh, with adults. But yes, there's a lot of uh, interesting potential applications. One that we have looked at a little bit or that we have had interest in is um, using scent for um, pain perception uh, in kids to reduce uh, pain, sensation of pain, and to also just calm them down, especially for kids uh, that are undergoing difficult medical treatments and so on. So uh, we have had partners sort of uh, um, think about that whole application area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, I think it's, like, it's very interesting also just to learn kids having, uh, like exploring the sense of sense at a very early mm -hmm. stage. So yeah, I would be wondering yeah. like how this yeah. results could look like. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we have sort of superpowers in a way that we're not aware of <laughs> people. <laughs> and, to, and to a large extent, a lot of our work is about helping people explore tools, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good morning, uh, Professor. Thank you. Um, I write the mood court problems for Osmocosm, and the topics of discussion relate to mental state, intent, which obviously is relevant to cognition, alertness, and some of the stuff that you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is reviving the memory of a witness in court through assent. Mm -hmm. So given what you have said here, even though I fantasize mm -hmm. these stories, it seems that they are very, very close to being technologically, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, real. Yeah. So what about the mental state well, and the intent of parties? Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? Can mm -hmm. we smell it? <laughs> the intent, I'm not sure about that. I mean, one difficulty is still that, um, like in the case of recreating a memory based on the scent that may have been there at the moment of, of a, an experience, you still have to be able to recreate that scent uh, effectively. Uh, we have worked with IFF, for example, the International Fragrances and Flavors uh, uh, company, in trying to recreate like the scent of the woods and things like that to help people with calming down and um, relaxing and so on. So often that is still um, an issue that has to be dealt with as well. It's not just about the delivery mechanism, but also um, yeah, capturing that scent and being, and then being able to uh, reproduce it in a different setting. Yeah. yeah thank you. I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's the mic. And then after that, will you introduce Cecilia? Will you introduce Cecilia? Thank you. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I have a question because uh, you mentioned that the slow sleep cycle is uh, is the best time to release the scent. Could you a uh, little bit elaborate uh, on that? Why is like this the best time? Yeah. So basically, um, people, sleep researchers, have for a long time known that um, we sort of go through these different stages um, uh, while we're sleeping. And they have just previously associated slow wave sleep or deep sleep with memory consolidation, basically. So that's why, at least for that application of memory consolidation, um, uh, basically that that is the, the one that you want to target, the stage that you want to target. So you need to know, based on EEG and other data, where the person is in that sleep cycle to release the scent at the right moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. thank you so much. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. Yep.